We're talking about fungus. We're talking about mushrooms. That's right. A little category within agriculture you probably don't think all that much about. We're talking about mushrooms with my guest, Kyle Beaver, coming up in this episode of The Business of Agriculture. Hey, Damian Mason here with a question before we hop into this episode of The Business of Agriculture. If you farm for a living, you employ a lot of amazing technology from your inputs that you put into the soil to the tractor that you sit in, your combine, and the amazing data that it harvests. But has your soil analytics kept up technologically with everything else in your farming operation? I would venture to say that no, it is not. Sure, you check for your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and potassium, your micronutrients as well. But what about disease pressure? Do you know what diseases and what pests you're going to face next year? No, you don't. But you can now figure that out with Pattern Ag's predictive analytics. Think about it. They can tell you now with testing what the likelihood of facing nasty diseases, things like cyst nematode or uh, sudden death syndrome, what the likelihood of you having this in your field, then you know how to prepare, how to treat, and where to invest your money. It's using technology to make you bigger yields and therefore make you bigger money. Go to www.pattern.ag to learn more. They are pioneering the way in predictive agronomy. Hey there, welcome to another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture. got Kyle Beaver. He's a Snydertown, Pennsylvania entrepreneur and mushroom producer. And you're saying, what? Yeah, I think it's neat when we take little side ventures on the Business of Agriculture and cover niche categories that you probably have not really thought that much about. I've read about two articles in my life, 54 years of being in the business of agriculture, about Pennsylvania. I think it was the last article I read, like they grew those little mushrooms like you get in a can, I don't know, Old Dutch or something like this. And then I eat mushrooms uh, and, and my wife hates them which is really interesting to me. And I like mine marinated sometimes. Uh, I I go to the mushroom bar sometimes at the Fry's grocery store in Phoenix, Arizona, when I'm out here in my winter house. So I know very little about mushrooms. And this pitch came across from Kyle. He's like, hey, I've listened to a couple of your episodes. I'd like to tell you my story. And I said, you know what? I want to hear it because this is something, it's an entrepreneurial story. It's a niche in within agriculture. And I think it's got so much fascination. And also you tell me it's growing. So anyway, Kyle Beaver, welcome to the business of agriculture. You got a lot of stuff. We're going to talk about the three major portions within in mushroom production, the entire industry, uh, the export market, which most mushrooms apparently go to exports. Yeah, I didn't know that. Mushrooms and truffles. And we're going to talk about what you think the future can hold, as well as just tell us how you got into this. So anyway, thanks for being here. Thanks, Damian. Appreciate you having me on. So um, 10 Mile Mushrooms is a specialty gourmet mycelial farm growing fresh mushrooms and mycelium for other farms in the form of culture, spawn, and substrate. That is what I read about your company. Explain, yeah. explain first off, mycelial. I don't even know what that means. So start at the very beginning, <laughs> my friend. All right. So yeah, we're, we're essentially a mycelium farm, which which means we are producing the, the life structure, which is like essentially the roots of the mushrooms. And mushrooms, they, they're spending 97% of their actual lifetime in this mycelial form. So what you're eating at the grocery store is essentially 3% of the mushroom's life cycle, which is actually the reproductive stage. Um, so what we're doing is we're taking a few cells and expanding this into hundreds of pounds, thousands, tens of thousands of pounds of what we call substrate, which is colonized or wood-based, um, ag products, soy hulls, things like that. And we're letting these, this mycelium essentially colonize this stuff and it's ready to grow the fresh mushrooms. So so, we're expanding the mass. It, it is so different. You know, we have, we have had everything on here, 330 episodes or so of the business of agriculture, from corn to soybeans to wheat, you know, your major uh, broad acre commodities to specialty stuff. But what you just said there, first off, as a guy that goes morel mushroom hunting sometimes in the spring and in the end, we talk about how they pop up and that there's spores in the ground. And what you just said, you said the the fruit we eat or the mushroom we eat is only 3% of of what's happening because they spring up from all this stuff. So how the hell do you even know you're cultivating it? It's not like planting a seed. I mean, let's just kind of Let's start about the the science of that, and then let's talk about your production. 
Yeah, certainly. So, so what's happening? And we, we get this question a lot because people have to ask, you know, how do you know exactly what you're growing? So just like, just like seed banks, there are culture banks all over the world. Um, there's quite a few, you know, in Europe, Asia, there's a lot, um, with the Chinese leading in mushroom consumption, there's a lot from over that way. Um, but really what's happening is people are growing out these different combinations of genetics of mushrooms and they're finding ones that are commercially viable. So they're, they're storing these in either cryogenic storage on auger, what they grow bacteria on or, you know, other various ways. But anyways, people are growing out these mushrooms and they're finding these specific genetics that grow well. So in order to keep these genetics, what happens with mushrooms is they're splitting cells, right? So you're taking the cells from, you could take the cells from a grocery store mushroom, let's say, and put them on auger, grow them out. You would be growing the same genetic code. So that's how we know what we're growing. We're buying these commercial strains that are exactly what has been grown before. So we're not taking spores. We are actually never using spores in our part of the industry. Interesting. So it's, and it's so unlike other plant farms where it's, you know, uh, you go back to plant biology 108 at Purdue and, you know, about the pistol Mm -hmm. and the stems and all the different parts of a plant. And then, and then the seed obviously is the most important thing. We don't have that in mushrooms, and it's just it's an interesting thing from from you know being a something you cultivate. Um, How did you get started? Tell me about the background of Ten Mile Mushrooms. So, so Ten Mile Mushrooms was essentially founded on the uh, you know the whim of wanting to work for myself, but also the uh, the the niche of fungi in itself really drew my attention. Um, I worked for many other small businesses that kind of. You know, we're we're about the niche type products, and I saw how they had a following, and how there was you know really really interesting things going on. Um, so, kind of ended up being able to find a little bit of space, um, and didn't know what I wanted to do. Kind of typed in Google. I've always been a biology guy, so I I was looking for something you know to do with nature. But I just typed in Google things to do with small amounts of space. And that's when mushroom growing came <laughs> up. And it's insane how it happened. And, you know, I just thought it was really cool and um, invested $300 to start and kind of grew my first oyster mushrooms. And after I ate them, I was like, wow, there is definitely something here because I have not seen these in the grocery store and any of our major grocery store chains. And they are absolutely delicious. And they quite frankly changed my mind on eating mushrooms, you know? So, um, after that, you know, it just got deeper and deeper and, and things progressed. I want, I want to tell you that not one person in my uh, recordings or in my travels or in my business, I've never talked to a person who got into a, a, a category of production agriculture by sitting around Google searching, what can I do with $300 in a small that's, amount of space? That is how I, uh, that's how I do. That's how I do it. I watch YouTube. I, you know, follow people. No agricultural background at all. No, 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 ag, no ag experience. Um, I just have a slight Jack of all trades type thing going on, you know? So, you know, a little bit of HVAC experience, plumbing, things like that. Um, like I was, we were talking about prior to the podcast, we just built an 8,000 square foot facility. Yeah, so you're handy. You're handy. That's fine. You're, you're not afraid right, of right. having to dig into stuff. How old are you, Tom? Uh, 31, 31. You started this when you were 25 years old. Yeah. All right. So, uh, you grabbed $300, you did your search and you got some, some sub, sub, substrate, is that what it's called? And some mycelial, what, 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 what did you buy with your $300? Yes. Yeah, so, so with that, that money, I bought straw, which we know you longer use straw in production, but that's what you'll see in Kennett Square, right here in Pennsylvania, the mushroom capital of the world. Um, they still grow a lot of oyster mushrooms on straw. Um, it's an outdated technique and that's why we're using hardwood substrate. But uh, that, that is how I started. You know, I bought some straw, bought some spawn from some local suppliers um, that I found online. And I used some lime, some hydrated lime, kind of killed the stuff in the straw a little bit, raised the pH. Um, hydrated lime will raise the pH and then drop it in a couple of hours and um, kind of kill most of the microbes. So we inoculated that and 
you know, grew my first oyster mushrooms and it was, uh, you know, quite an experience to, to do it from start to finish. Um, so yes, yeah, so you just said Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is the leading producer of, uh, of mushrooms in the United States, correct? Yeah, correct. And, but, uh, really 95, maybe 90% of that is specifically button mushroom production. Mm-hmm. Button mushrooms are the kind that we typically then find sliced on a pizza, right? Yeah. Yeah. Button mushrooms, cremini, portobello, um, how we were talking about the strains earlier. Um, those are actually all the same exact strain of mushroom that they allow to continue to grow. It's actually a, a kind of a marketing thing. You know, they, they add some light and they turn brown. Those are creminis. They let them get a little bigger. Those are portobellas. And so the mushroom that we basically we only eat one uh, yes. species, one type of a mushroom. Yes. I and mean, it's just a matter of whether they pick it when it's little and then we put it in marinade or slice it and throw it on a pizza, or like you said, let it get the light yeah. of day and then it changes its color, maybe the texture as well. And then when it's, mm-hmm. once they let it get big, it becomes a portobella, those get kind of dry and big and sort of uh, puff puff bully, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. It's it, it's funny. And then, you know, we're here producing uh, 15 different species at, at the moment, you know, on a consistent basis. Yeah. I want to hear more about the, I want to hear more about the evolution. Six years into this, no ag background, you decided to do this. You've learned. I mean, obviously I just heard you yeah. talk about everything from straw to substrate to lime to pH levels. You've, 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 everybody listening to this that's, that loves agriculture likes you because they like the <laughs> fact that you got into this. Not really. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, there's there's all kinds of folks that they 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 think it's neat, or they drive by and they see things. Oh, I wish agriculture was like this or whatever. But they don't really they have no they have no um, credibility with ever actually trying to do it. As I point out, I I produced more calories of human consumption yeah. by the time I was ten years old on the farm than anybody else that you know with their herb gardens in the suburbs ever will. So <laughs> right. you've got it. So yeah, anyway, right. I want to hear about the learning curve. I want to hear about the growth. Yeah. So, I, I mean, there was, there's an exceptional learning curve and that's kind of why I, you know, why I reached out to you because, um, uh, we're now in a position to be able to help other farmers to, you know, spread the good word of, of the mycelium and, and be able to, uh, you know, produce substrate for these other people who are, you know, looking to build a business in, in the fungi world. Yeah. But, so the, um, the, yeah. the primary, but your primary revenue source right now, you don't have another job, right? This is it. No, this is it. Yep, this okay. is it. You, and your primary business, primary revenue source within Ten Mile Mushrooms is selling the stuff to other people. Maybe the, me that says, "I love mushrooms. Mm-hmm. I've got a dark space. I'm going to do this." And you sell me the stuff to get started. That's kind of where your primary revenue mm-hmm. is now. Not the supplies. Yeah. You can also do that, but you mean the actual the the seeds or whatever the hell they are. The mycelial. Yeah. 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 So tidbit, all of our, uh, all of our mushrooms are grown using LED lighting. So lighting is a, uh, triggering factor for them to grow, but yeah. So, so our main business is, um, mostly with startup farms. You know, we are working with some more well-established, um, entities now, but for the most part, we're working with starting farms. And, um, that's what has kind of driven my passion to, to start, looking for innovative ways to change this industry and make it more accessible for more people because it's in such a fledgling stage and there is so much potential. Mm-hmm. But like we were talking about the the, the multiple steps of the industry, um, you know, it's impossible for people who are one or two people to do it all. Um, I- but that's exactly what I did. And that's kind of how I got to this conclusion, you know, by trial and error and lots of failure. Yeah. You you now have three employees or at least part time and yourself and you're growing. So I want you to go ahead and I talk about the evolution. I want you to give me from the first crop then to where you are today, the whole story. But before I do that, I want to remind you, dear listeners, that there might be an opportunity for you if you own land or you work with people that own land or your parents own land or you're going to buy. If you are a farmer, there might be opportunity to earn revenue on acres that are being farmed right now. Let's face it, we're heading into lower commodity prices. We're going to have some choppy economic times ahead of us in production agriculture. Maybe you could make money in what we talk about as ecosystem marketing, 
there's going to be more regulatory uh, environment in agriculture. Why not get ahead of it? Start documenting what you do and then team up with Truterra. Truterra is focused on supporting farmers at every stage of your sustainability journey to help plan, make, and maintain regenerative management practices that can improve your agronomic, but also your economic your environmental as well as your economic outcomes. The point is you can get paid for things like cover crops, reduce tillage, things like that. Go to truterraag.com slash enroll. Just go to truterra.com, truterra.com, truterraag.com and check it out. All right. So you've got your $300 worth of uh, investment and you went to your uh, small space, not a basement. I don't know where you started. You got your straw and you started growing. You said oyster mushrooms. Where do those go? Oy- oyster mushrooms. Yeah. Where do they grow? Where do what what where do the, what happens to them after you produce them? So after after we produce them, uh, mostly local farmers markets right now, um, and that's that's the the great and beautiful thing about what's happening right now is even now with the last five years, the tremendous group growth that I've seen, and even especially after COVID, um, you know there are still not many places where these local larger scale grocery chains are being tapped. Um, so for the most part, a lot of our smaller farms are working directly to the consumer at farmers markets. Okay, so an oyster mushroom, uh, I'm trying to picture that. You already told me that the 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 the, the portobello is the same as the whatever the hell is a nubbin. What's the, what's it called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, cremini button. Yeah. Button. So anyway, what's what's where's an oyster? What's it what's it do? Does it become like do I cook this on my grill? Do I slice it up? What do I do with an oyster mushroom? Yeah, I mean, they do. Um, so the beautiful thing and why, why I personally fell in love with oyster mushrooms is they are extremely, they're extremely meaty. So they do good on steaks. They do good, do good on burgers. Um, honestly, just frying them in some batter is delicious. Um, yeah. There's just, that's the, the great thing about mushrooms is they do well in literally every dish because they're not, especially the mushrooms that we grow, they're extremely mild, meaning they're going to take on the flavor of whatever you're cooking, you know? So they, they, that's, you know, the message we're trying to spread is that these mushrooms do not taste like the canned mushrooms that you've been buying at the, at the grocery store, you know, or your well, parents were buying. that's one of the big things, the Kyle, because store. when you, you know, just like tomatoes, I, I love tomatoes and I eat them between about sometime in July and sometime around mid-October uh, off my garden in Indiana, because a store bought mushroom tastes, I'm sorry, a store bought tomato tastes like nothing other than it's, it's got water. Right. And so it's right. the same thing with your mushrooms. You're saying that there is a, a tastier mushroom product grown the way you grow yours. Yeah, certainly. And I, and, you know, I can't tell you the exact science behind it, but it definitely has something to do with the wood-based substrate and, and the uh, ag byproducts that we're growing these on. So answer me then, um, you, you've evolved into selling the substrate and, the, and all that, but the first crop, some oyster mushrooms, then, then you decided to ramp up. So go ahead and take me through the journey and the growth. Yeah. So, uh, so we started, uh, messing around with other species of mushrooms, lion's mane, um, cordyceps for some time, um, shiitake, many different varieties of oyster mushrooms. We grow, I think six different colors right now. Um, from blue to yellow to snow white to tan. Um, does taste does yeah. taste change along with color? So depending on the cultures, usually a lot of times the texture and the um, overall consistency of the mushrooms can change. Um, definitely different species have slightly different flavors. Like shiitake is by far the most flavorful mushroom we grow, but. You know, an oyster mushroom, I wouldn't say it has a lot of flavor. It's all about how you cook it for the most part. Okay. All right. So you grew, you started growing different varieties. So you then you branched out, started growing different species, still selling them direct to consumer. Do you have a website that is, I mean, on your website, does it sell, do you sell mushrooms still? Or is, is that something you just got out of? When did you, when did you make that switch? So we, we, we still do sell locally a little bit here and there, you know, we're trying, trying to get away from it and focus more on our wholesale business. Um, but you know, I, I don't really want to give up that, that connection to the community, honestly, but, um, we sell, you know, ready to fruit grow kits for your tabletop in your kitchen on our website. We sell dried mushrooms, tinctures. Um, there's, you know, endless amount of second and secondary products that you can make out of these things as well. So we do offer all that kind of stuff. Why'd you decide, okay, so 
When did you decide to make the to concentrate more on the supplying other producers with the stuff they need to grow mushrooms versus ramping up the production for human consumption on your on your end? Why 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 did you make was it a business decision? Well, it was a hundred percent a business decision. I live in uh, the middle of North Central PA here, and to uh, make a full living selling fresh mushrooms, first off, the farmers markets are six months out of the year. Yeah. Um, how do you scale up when you don't have the space to do it? Um, and I saw the need in the niche for the opening that was the substrate supplying. And, um, you know, there's only, we're one of maybe three or four companies on the East coast that do this and maybe out of a handful that do it in the entire country. Um, so, you know, we have the capabilities and the logistical capabilities to ship anywhere in the U S which being in Pennsylvania, we're, we're very grateful for, you know? Yeah. So you made the decision because uh, of space, et cetera, et cetera. And you did grow your own space. You said you built 8,000 square feet. What happens in your facility now? You, you, you have the facility. You're not, you're not a little bit of it is devoted to actually producing mushrooms, but the rest of it is mm -hmm. producing the stuff that makes mushrooms. So tell me what happens and how it works. Yeah. So, so we pretty much have a, a large, you know, apple, apple orchard size cooler, um, that we're storing all of these blocks in after they're fully colonized. So what we're doing is, well, uh, here at 10 mile mushrooms, we do the whole process from auger storing our own master, you know, slants and cultures. Um, and by the way, the you're, way you're, using, you're using a little bit of fungus vernacular. Auger, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Auger and slant. Define so auger auger a slant is a long term storage of auger and what auger is is what they grow uh, bacteria on in labs so everything we do is sterile everything we do is either sterilized put through a pressure cooker used steam pasteurization um, so so there is like a, a lab and a technical side to this as well so that's you know all of our cultures are stored on this auger. And this auger is then expanded to sterilize grain, um, which right now we use wheat. So we'll hydrate this wheat, bag it out, sterilize it in a pressure cooker or an autoclave, and we'll expand that auger. By expand, I mean we'll take pieces of that auger and drop it into the grain, and the mycelium will start eating onto the grain. And once that's fully ready, we can expand it to more grain where we can then expand it to the ready to fruit substrate. Okay, now that's really colonize. interesting. And, and by the way, ready to fruit substrate, again, that's vernacular within your industry. It, the the write-up that I got here in front of me uses that exact vernacular. Uh, ready to fruit substrate makes you think, okay, there are pears that are ready to be made into pear pudding or whatever. There are apples to be ready to be <laughs> right. mixed into applesauce. But what you're saying is it is, it is a living organism that's, Close yep. to actually then producing what we see as a mushroom, ready to fruit substrate means it's it's the crap ready to then grow a mushroom. Mm -hmm. So if I buy this off of you, is it a flat? Is it a piece of dirt? Is it a, a little? Is it like a, a tray of plants? What does it look like if I buy? Yeah, it? I, I don't know why I don't have one in here. Okay, you're gonna send um, me a so picture. You're gonna send me a picture. I'm gonna have my marketing. Uh, I'm sorry, my Excellent. production gal put it up. Go ahead. That's perfect. Yeah. So what it is, it's uh, so the grain, the substrate, the wood and soy and bran or whatever else we're using, um, it's all placed into usually five or 10 pound myco bags, they're called. So these myco bags are polypropylene and they have a filter patch on them that allows for gas exchange. So we fill them up with the substrate, we sterilize them, inoculate them, seal them. And the only gas exchange is then coming through that filter patch. So usually we're making kind of like, uh, you know, nine by nine by nine bricks essentially is what they are. Nine um, inch by nine inch by nine inch? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. By 11 inch. Yeah. So okay. they're 10 pounds. They're okay. I buy this block, this 10 pound block off of you. And it, um, I'm imagining it's a bit like a, a mineral block almost. Okay. But yeah. don't it? But yeah, it's usually white. Yeah, but it only weighs 10 pounds, not 50. Okay, then I right, get right. that. How, what do I do with it once it comes to me? What do I do with it? Right, so so being ready to fruit, essentially all that they need in order to produce mushrooms is humidity, light, and airflow. Um, so the, bag, the mycelium is there in the bag. You're going to take a razor blade, 
cut directly into the bag, into the mycelium, which is going to tear that hyphae a little bit, the hyphae being the strands of mycelium. Okay. And um, it's going to create a little reaction there where the mycelium is like, oh, no, we need to repair. And uh, where you cut the bag, you're allowing oxygen to touch the substrate and the light all come together to create what we call pinning, which is where the mushroom actually starts to form in the slice that you've made. Um, so you're going to give them a bunch of humidity. You're going to give them some light, some oxygen, because unlike plants, mushrooms use oxygen just like us. And um, oh, now that's interesting because you said the three things we need are humidity. Everybody thinks that when you think of a fungus, you think of a mushroom, humid, right? You, that sure. makes sense. Light. Most people wouldn't think light. You need light no. for chlorophyll. You need light for you need light for photosynthesis with you know plants that have have chlorophyll in their leaves. Mm -hmm. Mushrooms don't have that. Do you think the opposite? I think they need humidity and dark. I think they need to be in a in a cellar somewhere. Why the light? So the light is just uh, some. I don't know again the exact science behind it, how to explain it, and and you know super specific terms. But it is it is initiating some sort of reaction between the oxygen and the mycelium, recognizing that it has now ran out of food. So it knows that there's no more substrate in there to eat up, and it needs to get out. Interesting. So, so that's the idea. And then, so when you say it's the fruit, the thing that we eat, the mushroom, is the very last thing it does before it dies. I mean, th that's its that's its attempt to procreate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So our blocks, they will continue to flush. Um, a flush is what we call a whole, you know, cluster of mushrooms. Uh, usually, the blocks will will flush two to three times, and each time getting a, you know, a little bit less and less um, yield from the block because it's using up that energy that you put into it. Makes sense. Where do I put this block, Kyle? Do I put this in a, in a, in a, do I have a tray? Do I, you know, you built a barn and you, you started, when you started, you built a, you had 800 square feet, you've grown to 8,000 square feet. Where do I do the people you're trying to help get going in this? Do they put this in a barn somewhere and, and then, uh, like you said, yeah. turn on some LED lights and then have some sprinklers? What's the operation yeah, like so, post you? So, our first grow room was actually an old potato storage bin. Um, it was a, uh, you know, just a concrete kind of cellar type type room underground. But I mean, basement, anything that you can seal up airtight. I mean, we have customers who are growing in all types of places. We have a customer who's bought an old school who was growing in the classrooms, you know, you essentially seal, anywhere. You said seal up airtight. And then you also spoke about oxygen. Obviously, plants use CO two. Mm -hmm. I mean, CO two is the is the thing of life for the for the plants, but not for mushrooms. They want oxygen, right? Right, exactly. So the reason why we're we're trying to control the airflow because what will happen is these when these things actually start growing, the actual mushroom itself, they grow extremely fast. I mean, especially as in higher temperatures, which a fourth big factor is temperature regulation. Um, but is not necessary for the actual fungus to grow. Um, it's definitely necessary to produce a good product. But so, but what's that? What's the right temperature control? I assume you want it to be like sixty. Yes, exactly. Yep, exactly. Sixty is like primo temperature. Um, but getting getting a little bit warmer. I mean, these things will grow in twenty four hours. You'll have a normal mushroom to a huge mushroom, which is now blowing spores millions of microscopic spores all over the place so we try to prevent that by harvesting at the right time and it it makes a mess it, it's impossible to clean when you're not well, letting these things i mean if you let them go over a weekend you will have a room that is literally smurf blue covered in spores you know what's interesting is you've, you've described something that some of this makes a lot of sense and some of it the uh the light and then the super clean when i think of where i would find mushrooms i would think I'd pile up a bunch of uh, cow shit with straw in it and, and, that's and, keep, <laughs> and keep it dark and it would just have mushrooms growing it. That's what I would think. But you have you described almost the antithesis of that. Yeah, that, that is the funny thing about it. I mean, and that's that's what is so interesting and why I think people are so interested in mycology in general, because it's it's absolutely the opposite of what you would think and what what we were taught as children. And that, you know, growing up, this is just it's it's new. It's new and it's it's interesting.
Yeah, and I want to get to that where, you know, first off, the you talk about the industry, you think the growth and then where these products go, because remarkably, we don't even eat that many mushrooms in the United States. And I can tell you that, you know, anything you can throw on a pizza, you would think then gets a boatload of consumption. But according to you, uh, we're way behind globally. Before we uh, get into where these mushrooms go and some other questions for our friend Kyle Beaver here with 10 Mile Mushrooms, I want to uh, tell you about my new sponsor, Redox Bionutrients. Redox Bionutrients is in the bionutrient space. And no, let's not confuse this with the newfangled biologicals, of which there are 1,200 of them out there with boatloads of venture capital money flowing into them. Bionutrients is a family business uh, begun by Darren Moon 30 years ago. They've got a track record. They've been in turf for a very long time, and they're getting more and more utilization in broad acre agriculture. So I want to tell you that uh, moving from turf into ag has been really good for them. 30 years of proven infield success. Redox is helping farmers shift from traditional fertilizers to carbon-based technology. Very efficient and also plays into the environmental regulatory environment we might all be moving into. Redox Bionutrients provides superior nutrition, abiotics, abiotic stress defense, root growth, soil health, and it improves your nutrient uptake efficiency. Find out more at redoxgrows.com, R-E-D-O-X, redoxgrows.com. Check out the Redox Grows podcast. I was a guest, actually, last month. Check it out. That's redoxgrows.com. All right, Kyle, um, this is neat, and there's going to be a skeptic listening to this, and they're going, oh, yeah, this sure. is neat. Sure. You know, Damien had some 31-year-old kid on there that, like, you know, Googled around and decided, <laughs> yes. hey, man, I could either grow, like, some pot in my basement in my grow room or I'm going to grow some mushrooms. But I think we, yes. should dispel, we should dispel that myth. You've got three employees. You've got a business. It's your only It's your only work. You actually are viable. You're, you, you, did you have investors or have you grown this and are you paying your own way? And and really, you know, is the business is the business going to go somewhere? And I think that's that's a legit question. Six yeah. years into it. A hundred percent. That's that's for sure. Um, the, the answer to your question is yes, the business will definitely go somewhere. We have good footing in, in a new industry. But, um, you know there's just there's so much opportunity here and it, there has there has to be people to, to pave the way you know somewhere um and that's why that's why we're here saying that you know we're here to help and and i'm i'm really interested in seeing what this industry can become because there is absolutely just so many secondary and tertiary products that can come from this stuff i mean you know, it's like it's like we we take it and make it into so many of these things. Well, you know, mushrooms, there's untouched. Right. So and is mushroom consumption growing? That's one question. And it seems I don't know. Uh, you gave me some numbers. We're up about 1.6 percent in the U.S. Japan's down a little bit, but that's probably not because they're eating less. It's because the Japanese population is declining. They're yes, getting old. For sure. um, China eats up eats up absolute barges after barges of mushrooms what the hell's going on there so tell me a little bit about where these go yeah so so you want to hear more about the secondary and, and tertiary type products yep yeah so a lot of the things we're growing are not only just delicious but also have been are starting to be proven to be medicinal and you can go onto google you can do you know your google researches there there's a lot of research coming out now um regarding things like lion's mane and its potential you know neurological capabilities um you know mushrooms in general contain a huge amount of protein for what they are um very similar to potentially some cuts of chicken yeah you know so it, it's very interesting do you think the future of this obviously the the play you're making is to somebody that wants to have a uh, small scale agriculture or with it, you know, whatever they want to grow some of this, um, either for farmers markets or for their own human consumption, or whatever. Is this a growth area or do you concern yourself? Does it concern you, you know, during the COVID thing, a whole bunch of people became backyard gardeners and it lasted about three weeks uh, when they decided <laughs> to, yeah, you, know, you got pull weeds. You actually got to work your ass off to have a, a successful garden. Um, do you, do you, do you have concerns that this is a, a fad or do you think this is something that because it does, it, it does, there's a certain customer that's going to do this and there's a bunch of customers that are not going to mm -hmm. buy blocks off of you and grow their own mushrooms. Mm -hmm. So, you know, where does that go and what do you think? Yeah. 
Yeah. So the, I mean, the fact of the matter is people are definitely eating more mushrooms yeah. and you know, our society is certainly becoming a little bit more health conscious. Yeah. Um, and to coincide with that, where the future of agriculture in general is heading, you know, some of these major, major problems and hurdles that we're facing to feed, you know, feed the earth. Mm -hmm. um, this is just a super viable option as far as urban agriculture goes and utilizing unused space, you know, you turn a strip mall into a. Uh, yeah, fruit. right, right. I mean, indoor, right, indoor yeah. agriculture. We've heard a lot, Kyle, about indoor agriculture, and actually, I did right, a right. about it. And, and the thing is, it it it's had a lot of uh, talk, but less inertia. Like indoor agriculture was going to be the thing. It was it was hyped, but it still hasn't bloomed, and it still hasn't blo hasn't mm -hmm. blown up. But your thing, do you think you end up supplying uh, uh, more mom and dad, mom and pop uh, guy in his basement, or do you think you end up supplying legitimate? Like uh, the kind of operation that has 20 acres, they do ag uh, tourism, they have pumpkins, yes. they have mushrooms, they grow blueberries. You Do you think that your customer is like the sort of place where they are an ag entrepreneur like you, except for they have 10 acres in the country and they do a little bit of everything and, and mostly sell direct to consumer? I'm kind of thinking that's who your customer is, but I'm not sure. Yeah, 100%. That, that's definitely where a lot of our customers lie right now. But, you know, with this recent expansion, there's there's so much potential to actually, you know, potentially produce with, alongside with, with, you know, our, our customer friends, um, millions of pounds of mushrooms, really. And we're looking to do it on a more commercial scale and bring this to the public in your local giant or wise or wherever you're at your kroger you know yeah except there is still a lot of your customers don't have contracts with giant or kroger or walmart so they're going mm -hmm. to end up selling but more than ever the consumer today is more accepting and willing to go online to damien's mushrooms.com which isn't mm -hmm. really a thing folks don't type that in <laughs> and, and, not yet and buy, <laughs> and, buy, and buy direct to consumer. So I see that being a strength for you. Ease of entry, I see being a strength for you. Um, scalability, everybody talks about that. If I'm ever in a oh, corporate, that's... if I'm ever in a corporate boardroom, I'm just going to sit in the corner and then raise my hand and say, "Is it scalable?" And then everybody will say, "Oh God, you're a genius." I love that. Yes. <laughs> Is it scalable? Well, that's actually been a question we've been pondering a lot, uh, a lot recently, and. Uh... You know, I think we've came up with a super innovative and great solution under the, you know, under our uh, subsidiary comp company here, Syncofear Mycotech. Um, so what we're doing is you need, this also takes investment, just like any other ag venture. Um, you know, we need mixers, we need specialty built baggers that are going to weigh out 10 pounds of substrate and dump it in a bag. Um, there's farms buying, you know, auto automatic equipment and things like that of this nature. Um, so you're buying raw materials, you're having to combine it. A lot of people use hardwood salt, uh, sawdust or fuel pellets. So from the fuel pellets idea, um, started dealing and messing around with briquettes. So what we've done is we've combined all of the ingredients you need to make a substrate block into a briquette. Um, essentially eliminating all of the need for any type of real startup investment in equipment other than a grow room and you mean for your customers farm. you mean for your customers yes or, or for, not for even our customers for people who want to produce their own substrate you know okay so they're cutting out the the industrial machinery needed to actually put their hands and make some substrate you know Okay, so you're you're empowering uh, the people to compete with you. Uh, that seems like maybe that might be a bad business move. You're you're creating your own competition. Well, there's I, I believe there is that much room for growth. I mean, Damien, in the last five years, I have seen probably just in Pennsylvania, fifty mushroom farms come and go. Yeah, and uh, you know it, it's it's a fad. There's no doubt that there's a fad aspect to it, but there's going to be winners who are going to stick around. Do you think they come? A lot of times, the go isn't because they couldn't make money. They it was you know that was the old thing I would say. Fifty percent of small businesses don't they say fail. Well, I'm just quit. <laughs> this is like, this maybe, is and that's exactly where we're at. There's there's a lot of trial and error that needs to go into this. We are eliminating a huge step of that um, with these combo 
master grow bricks. So I'm excited to, you know, see what the future holds. Like, like I said, we're here to empower other people. I think it's the the way the industry moves forward in, in all phases. I agree. Uh, I like mushrooms and you talked about it being a growth category. There's ancillary products within the mushroom business and there's also the potential for mushroom consumption to grow itself. A couple of other notes here I pulled up that you sent me were about the uh, the interaction with soil. Um, we're finally in broad acre agriculture. Some of us are starting to really sound the alarm about excess tillage, erosion, um, you know, d- using so many synthetic products that we've harmed the fungi to bacteria relationship. Is there a play? Is there a play you think long term? Like, does does the business you're working in play into bigger ag, like for regenerating soils? Do, do you see anything there? Yeah, I I, I see it absolutely. It's a, it coinciding. might be a little off. It's a little off your reservation, admittedly, but it just it seems to me there could be some cohesion. Yeah, in term. and that's what I'm saying. That there's there's so many other avenues here that are just unexplored in general. Um, I mean, as, as you probably know, mycorrhiza and things like that are used to to promote plant growth, and um, just being able to take ag byproducts, turn them back into carbon, and putting them back in the soil via mushroom soil is is alone a huge regenerative thing that we can be doing on a much larger scale um, so back back to the scale for you um do you have is like a, uh, is your goal to be double in five in, in six more years you've been at it for six years are you are you gonna be double are you gonna be 10 times the size what's your business gonna look like six years you're in it for six years what's it look six year six more years yeah, six more years. I'd say we're we're at at least double. You know, at least double, if not triple. Um, I, I honestly think we have the capacity to do double this year. Um, you know, it's really mushrooms and the industry. The processes are so under misunderstood yeah. that there's just so much education that has to go into you know getting these people set up to be successful because we can only be successful with each other you know just the way this this industry works it's not like planting a seed in the ground there's too many steps processes and equipment involved i wonder since you mentioned about the the flavor that when i explained this to a lot of my ag crowds we've got massive we got mass production figured out you know but let's bring back flavor and i've i've spoken to this there's a book called the dorito effect uh mark shasker writes about uh the flavor and how we've lost it at the to sacrifice it for efficiency and and affordability etc but there's a consumer out there that wants better food and i'm wondering if this plays into that trend quite a bit you know you mentioned the kroger's or the giant uh, or the walmart's i think whole foods i'm thinking online mm-hmm. is where mm-hmm. this goes because of the flavor effect. And um, I just guess I want to ask you, do you think that most consumers haven't ever really had a good mushroom? I, I And that's, yeah, that's that's one of the things that, that blows my mind, especially, you know, the last couple of years when we were doing farmer's markets and then the first three or four years where I was grinding and, and working at farmer's markets, you know, every, every other day or every day, um, I was hearing that on the daily, you know? So after hearing it a couple thousand times, it gets beat into your head that like, wow, nobody knows what we're doing and what this is. I mean, if all you ever had was a grocery store tomato, you'd say, what the hell's the allure of a grocery store tomato? And if you came to Daily exactly. Farms in about uh, August and had, our, you know, one of my one of my wife's gardens and Johnny Stoffel's gardens uh, tomatoes, mm-hmm. you'd say, got it, it smells like the earth. I cut into it. All I did was sprinkle a little salt and pepper on it, and it was like I was tasting the earth with a little salt and pepper on it with this odor. It's it's amazing. And I think that's maybe where your ears high is. Um, what about varieties? I mean, all of a sudden, is this is this going to be like the foodie movement brings us now uh, from four varieties of uh, we're going to have 50? I mean, that's where I think this thing goes also. Flavor and, uh, and shall we say, uh, broadening out our spectrum. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um- you see it every day in the uh, the the mushroom growing forums. People growing new varieties that were thought to be unable to be grown on a commercial scale. People experimenting, doing all kinds of really cool home science type stuff. And uh, 
yeah, I think it's going to continue to grow. And that's the thing Like we've barely scratched the surface here. There's many varieties that just, we could be growing, but it takes that scalability. It takes that equipment and things to be set up with the proper, you know, growing parameters to do some of these like my Taki, Inoki, some of these ones that are more specialty and more sought after are a little bit harder to grow. So I think as the industry becomes to get, becomes more advanced, um, you're going to start seeing a lot more different varieties popping up as well as more forage products, uh, foraging and wild mushrooms in general are absolutely on fire right now. And people are, are hot and heavy over it, you know? Well, then let me bring you to the next question. In my part of the world, sometime in May, the people that aren't good at finding mushrooms, kind of like me, I'm not very good at finding, I'm talking about morels. You can buy you can buy a quarter of morels for like 40 bucks or 50 bucks because they're, and people just get gaga over morel mushrooms. How come we don't grow morels? Can we grow morel mushrooms or is it still, I got to go out and find it uh, next to an elm tree in the woods? Yeah. So, so we're starting to do it. Obviously the, the Chinese are a little bit more advanced than we are and they're starting to, there's quite a few large scale farms popping up, uh, you know, over in Asia and, uh, they, they're, they're figuring out how to do it. And, um, usually it's a black morel culture and they're grown in a way in which people are saying they actually are lacking the flavor of wild forage morels, which is, you know, one of those symbiotic soil type things. Well, that's the tough part is that, is that um, if we can grow them to taste like the ones that I find in my woods uh, next to an elm tree where the bark is, just, as my friend Jim just always said, the bark's just starting to slide, meaning it can't be a completely dead elm, but it can't be a completely alive elm. It's going to be a, just the bark starting to slide off. Mm-hmm. Of that. that's, anyway, I love that term. That's great. Um, so morels are still the, the one that's going to be the challenge for us to, to be, bring into production agriculture. Yeah, and I, I don't believe it's going to be scalable, honestly, on it uh, on any level. Um, the way they're doing it now is they're growing it in humongous greenhouses. It requires a ton of acreage. Yeah. Um, you're only looking at three, two to three crops a year, maybe. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I just don't think it's going to be scalable in the uh, term, you know, in a way that it's going to bring it to the people. Sure. So anyway, but we still have, we, we should be excited though. We still got what you said, dozens and dozens of other species of mushrooms that are coming on because of people like you. All right. I like it. Uh, we took a little, uh, took a little trip down a niche here and I thought it was cool. His name's Kyle Beaver. The company's named 10 Mile Mushrooms. If somebody wants to learn more about this and get a hold of you, how do they do so? Yeah. Check us out on Facebook, 10 Mile Mushrooms. Check us out on Instagram at Grow Mush More. You can go to our website, 10milemushrooms.com. Um, if you're interested in wholesale blocks, there's a link there. Um, we'll be announcing the ready to fruit, you know, combined, um, substrate blocks, the master grow bricks here in a couple months, once production is online and, uh, yeah, reach out to us. We're willing to help and we're willing to, uh, you know, get, get your journey started. I like it. Six years in as an agricultural entrepreneur with absolutely zero agricultural background begun because he said, I want to do something on my own. I've got $300 and a few hundred square feet. (laughs) I love the story. Anyway, his name's Kyle Beaver. Thanks a lot for being here, my friend. Thank you, Damien. Appreciate it. You bet. Till next time, I'm Damien Mason, and this is the Business of Agriculture. Well, that concludes another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture. This episode was brought to you by Pattern Ag. You know, everybody in agriculture understands the importance of soil health. We also keep an eye on our soil better than we ever did through advanced soil testing. But what if there was a company that provided predictive analytics? Not just checking out nutrients and all the elements that are in there, but also could tell you the degree of risk you face with disease and pest pressure. That's right. Pattern Ag can do that. They actually can tell you, hey, you're going to have a real issue here. You can preemptively, proactively treat for corn rootworm or cyst nematode or sudden death syndrome before the problem actually starts costing you yield. Go to pattern.ag, that's www.pattern.ag to find the nearest rep that can help you start doing better for your soil. (laughs) 